Good morning, Redbud. A couple of quick announcements here. If you saw on our uh, slides going earlier, Sunday school next week is actually going to be at 10, 10 a.m., not 9.30 a.m. So if you come to the first service, that will be at 9 a.m., and your Sunday school or Redbud groups will be at 10, 10 a.m. If you're coming for the later service, the Sunday school or Redbud groups will be at 10, 10 a.m., and then you'll continue on to 11, 11 for the actual uh, contemporary service. This is um, going to be a couple of uh, soft runs, as we're calling them, right? A chance to work out all the kinks, make sure we got everything going by the time we have our grand opening, if you will, which will be on April 11th. Keep in mind that um, on Easter service, we're going to meet together for one service at 1111, and that's just on Easter. But from this point on, you will have a service, traditions, at 9 o'clock in the morning. You'll have Redbud groups or Sunday school at 1010 in the morning. And then you'll have a contemporary service if you want to be a part of that at 1111 in the morning. I will give you an announcement right now. We are live streaming at the moment, but we are live streaming to Facebook. Okay, that doesn't help anybody out there right now if they don't know to go to Facebook. But if you have a friend that's watching at home right now, let them know that there are, it's on the Redbud Baptist Facebook page. So I don't know what's going on with YouTube at the moment. I got a couple of ideas, but they're nothing that is in my control. So um, if someone you know, just tell them go to our Facebook page and they can get the live stream of the message. All right, now I realize some of you guys probably woke up and said, uh-oh, we lost an hour this morning. So what I want you to do is everybody go ahead and stand up. Everybody stand up, because we're gonna be a little bit tired, so let's get some oxygen flowing here. All right, lift up your right hand. Wave it around a little bit, all right. Lift up that left hand, wave it around a little bit. All right, twist a little bit to the right, don't hurt anything, twist a little bit to the left. Now, let's use this in the sanctuary. Look to the person on your right, wave to them with your right hand, all right. Look to the person on your left, wave your left. Obviously, you'll be moving your, your hips around too, so get that oxygen flowing, you may sit down. All right, <laughs> hopefully everybody at home uh, it's on Facebook at the moment. We'll catch that. We're glad you're here this morning. I know there's a lot of things changing at the moment. Please, please participate, support it, be a part of it. I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then I'm going to turn this over to Gershom and, and Shane, and they have some music for you this morning that we could worship to our Lord today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for an opportunity for us to share the gospel message, whether it's through our music in the worship time, whether it's through our Bible study that we did earlier, Lord, or whether it's through the message today, or whether it's through offering and giving of not only our resources, Lord, but our time, energy, and everything else. So, Lord, as we take this message today, your message, let be your words, led by the Holy Spirit through Carlos today, let's take and put it to our hearts and also to our hands and feet. Let it be an opportunity for us to share others about Jesus and the good news. And Lord, if there's anyone around us that needs to know about him, let the Spirit go before him right now. Let this be the last day that they don't know Christ. And Lord, let us disciple that person too and grow them up to be more Christ-like as we grow to be more Christ-like. Lord, bless this service for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, can y'all hear me? Is that better? All right. As you know, church, we always, every year, we we do a wonderful, wonderful a job of supporting one of the most uh, meaningful ministries that there is out there in all of our uh, country, and that is the ministry of the Gideons International. And uh, what they do uh, is, I, I think, sometimes uh, goes maybe to some extent unnoticed because they do ministry with... Uh, uh, all over the world with Bibles, much more, but but that's, you know, that's a big, big thing that we do. And so this morning, 
we have Larry Holland, who is with Gideon's International, and uh, I believe he's got a short video, and then he's going to share some things. And so, Larry, um, if you will, you can come here, and uh, um, Ty, if you'll give him this mic right here, the pulpit mic, Larry, would you come, and would you share with us what you need to share, and then we'll go from there. involved in drugs while I was in dental school thinking that I could do both, be a graduate student by day and doing drugs and partying. Well, this whole time my parents, they had been a Christian for several years now and just had really grown in their faith. My parents uh, knew the only way they would be able to see me since I wanted nothing to do with them. They actually flew, flew down to Atlanta one time and after the second day I kicked them out. But my dad, he wanted to give me something and it was his very first Bible and he left it on my kitchen counter. But as soon as they left, I took his Bible and I threw it in the trash can. My mom prayed that God would do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to the Father. Well, this miracle, this answer to prayer came one day with a bang on my door. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs and they confiscated all my money and my drugs and I was charged with a street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and as I looked at that garbage can, I felt like I was looking at my own life. And I was about to pass by that garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over and I picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell and for the very first time I opened up that New Testament and I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. And as I know today, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God. And it's living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword. And as I began to read God's word, it began to penetrate me. And it began to cut through my stubborn, hard heart. He revealed his plan for my life. And he called me in full-time ministry while I was in prison. So the greatest miracle of this whole story is that actually Moody accepted me. I was released from prison in July of 2001. And I started the very next month. I'm teaching now back at Moody in the Bible department. So I tell people I went from prisoner to professor. Only God can do that. Certainly, good morning, and, and thank you for having me here, Pastor. I, I truly appreciate it and, and the honor. I, I certainly hope everyone got one of these. Uh, this is a little brochure, and it has an, an envelope in it, and that's in case you uh, forgot to bring your checkbook. Uh, and also, there is a little um, area on here for a credit card information. If you'd like to, you know, leave that with us as well. So this little brochure here, the self-addressed um, envelope is, is great, and and if you need to use that, that'll be great. I, I know I'm gonna be at this door in particular over here, and I've got a little display of different kinds of Bibles there. So the the Gideons, they started, you know, like a hundred years ago, and, and a couple of salesmen, they got together, and they just wanted to know how they could, could help in a ministry, and they decided that they would just give away Bibles. Well, it's grown and grown, and today, as, of, as we speak, there's been over two billion of these little New Testaments and bigger Bibles have been given out all over the world. And they've been given out in like uh, over a hundred different languages. And so people can actually read the Bible in their own language. Uh, at the, over there, I'm gonna have uh, my, my, my card, my Gideon card, if you'd like one. There is also this little card that you can click on this QR code and uh, me, I need to get my grandkids to help me but it will bring up a, a Bible app. And I know through that Bible app, people in foreign countries have been able to also get an electronic version in their own language. 
and I, I'm just pleased that the Gideons are, have grown to so, bi so much, so much. There's, this Bible, in, in particular, from, from this side, it's an English New Testament. And then from this side, because they read from the different direction, it's Arabic. And so these Bibles, they just go all over the place. And I would encourage you to give, encourage you to help us. As the young man in the video said, he, he finally read the Word of God, and it changed his life. And this is something that his testimony has happened over and over and over and over again. I'm going to be at that door. Some others may be at the other doors. And Pastor, thank you very much. So church, I, I want to thank you for uh, taking a moment to listen. I'm stand, but as I, I do, let me let me remind you that uh, as we do every every year, we'll have uh, our men standing at each of these doors with an open Bible. You begin to pray now about what God would lead you to give uh, to support this wonderful ministry. Because you know, church, one of the claims that we make as a church, not only as a church, but the convention that we're part of, whether it's a national convention or the state convention, is that we are people of God's word. We are people of the word. We believe that the Bible has the power to affect people's lives. And there's nothing greater that we can do than to put a Bible in somebody's hand who desperately needs to read it. Amen? So let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving, not only to Redbud, but let's support the ministry of the Gideons International as they give out Bibles to people who desperately need them. Thank you, Gershon. What a powerful testimony we just saw. And we know that uh, that happens because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's sing on that. Good to see you this morning. Lift our voices. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day this morning. The sun is shining. Let's just sing our praises to God. Sing of his power. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you leave evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Let me hear an amen this morning.
Awesome. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And I want to see you. Lord. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. And I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Won't you open the eyes of my heart? I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. You're shining in the light of your glory. You pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up. You're shining in the light of your glory. Your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see. our prayer that we can see our Lord and we see his truth and live his truth. shame 
and I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a Our 
sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. He's stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Let me hear an amen this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for singing, worshiping. Well, it's again good to see all of you this morning. Glad that you're here. As James reminded us a while ago, many of us probably forgot to move our clocks. Um, I uh, have to confess, uh, Sylvia and I did, and uh, so this morning we were rushing, but we made it here. We got here on time, and I'm glad that you did too. We're going to continue our series this morning called The Resurrection Power, and uh, the title of today's message is in the form of a question, and the title is, What is at stake without the resurrection? What is at stake without the resurrection? And the text for this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where we'll be for the next several weeks. Chapter 15 of the letter to the Corinthians. Today we will be looking at verses 12 through verse 20. 12 through verse 20. And um, so I will uh, give you a little bit of time to um, find that text. As you, as you begin to find it, I'm going to invite you to stand one more time. We'll read it. We'll pray and then uh, we'll take our seats and we'll get into God's message this morning. And beginning there in verse 12, this is what the Bible says. Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men the most pitiable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But verse 20 says this, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for reminding us of the work that was done on the cross for us, the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the burial of our Savior in that tomb, but the opening of that tomb on that third day, that early morning, when those women went to the tomb and found the tomb open, and the tomb empty. We know in our hearts, Lord, those of us who have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we know that he is alive. We know that he sits at the right hand of the Father. And I pray, Lord, that this morning you would help us to come to grips with that. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who is still wrestling with that in their own life, I pray, God, that you help them today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Many of you might remember an incident that happened in the early 70s called Watergate. 
Watergate gave us a man by the name of Charles Colson. Charles Colson, because of Watergate, went to prison, and there in prison he found the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, and he wrote several books and started a ministry to uh, prisoners and uh, served God well until his passing several years ago. But I, in his, one of his uh, statements that he made, he said this concerning the resurrection. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Charles Swindoll wrote this concerning the resurrection. The devil, darkness, and death may swagger and boast. The pangs of life will sting for a while longer, but don't worry. The forces of evil are breathing their last. Not to worry. He is risen. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ is alive. If there is no resurrection, what are the implications? Think about that for a second. If there is no resurrection, what would be the implications of a tomb that is still filled with a body somewhere in the nation of Israel? This is important because at the time of the writing of, the, of, of 1 Corinthians, there were some within the church who were spreading a lie. These people denied the resurrection. Paul mentions eight implications if there is no resurrection. And let me just kind of give you a little bit of a rundown. The problem in Corinth uh, was a subject that we call dualism. And uh, John Nemi, in his sermon entitled Six Consequences If Easter is About a Bunny, wrote this. Based on their pagan background, Many first century Corinthians believed in a form of dualism, a worldview in which immaterial aspects of life are inherently good, while material aspects are inherently bad. According to the view, this view, most notably taught by the Greek philosopher Plato, the human soul was trapped in its body until death, at which point it was forever liberated from such bondage. And so many in the Corinthian church believed this idea, and so the idea of a bodily resurrection was, was not a favorable position to take for them because they considered your soul to be trapped inside that body. And the idea of returning to another body for the soul to be entrapped again was just ridiculous to them. They, they would not have that. They did not want that. And so some within the Corinthian culture uh, believed this, and those who had, uh, uh, were part of the church in Corinth were still hanging on to that idea, and not only hanging on to it themselves personally, but promoting that, which is why Paul says, how is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection? Unfortunately, that hasn't changed much. Today, in, a, in, in our world, there is a dual extreme as well. Maybe not exactly like the Corinthians and the Greeks at the time of the writing of this letter, but when it comes to our bodies, I think there are two extremes. One says this body is decaying, so it really doesn't matter much what happens to it not realizing, perhaps, that Paul 
in this very same letter, in chapter 6, verses 12 through 20, wrote these words, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are, are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. And now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised up the Lord and will, uh, will also raise us up by his power. Do, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And so for some, uh, he went on to say, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And so one extreme t tends to take the position that, well, this body is decaying, it's no good, it's going to go in the ground, it's going to be forgotten and never to be raised up again. So I can, I can pretty much do what I, what I want with my body. I can live the way I want to, I can treat it the way I want to, I can do all kinds of things with my body because that's my body. And that's one extreme. The other extreme is, of course, overconsumption with our bodies, or that is thousands and thousands of dollars are spent on our bodies just to keep them looking young and attractive. And so we can go to one extreme or the other when it comes to the body. We can treat it as if it's nothing and it, and it doesn't matter, or we can take it and glorify it and worship it and do all of the things that we want to with our body, neglecting the spirit and the soul. And that's where some people are. Some people find themselves in those extremes. People in Corinth and sadly, in our modern world, live by the phrase that we use today. And that is when we say that w the attitude that says that, that we can have our cake and eat it too. Christians today want to party and dance and drink with the world on Saturday and praise when, it, when the church gathers on Sunday. We want one foot in the world and one foot in church thinking that that is okay with God. And I am here to tell you this morning that Paul says to the Corinthians, when it comes to your body, something other than just going in the ground and forgotten is going to happen to it. And so Paul turns to this Corinthian church with their form of dualism and says... How is it that some of you who claim to be Christians, who claim to serve God, who claim that to have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, now deny one of the basic tenets of the gospel? Remember that last week we said the gospel is very simple. The gospel is Jesus Christ died for our sin, was buried in the tomb, and on the third day he rose. That's the gospel that we preach. That's, that's, that's it. It's a, it's a very simple message. And all of that is the message that we deliver to people that they might come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be saved from their sinful lifestyle. That's the gospel. But if you take the resurrection away, Paul says in, in this chapter, he says, if you take the resurrection of the body, if you take that out of the picture, then what is it that you have? What are the implications? What is it that you, that you have? And Paul gives us in these verses those things that happen as a result of removing the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, from the dead. And the first one is obvious. He says that uh, if you're taking notes there, the first one, if you want to jot that down, is Jesus is still in the grave. If there is no resurrection, if there is no bodily resurrection, people cannot come back from the dead as Jesus did, 
then there is, there, is no, there, there, there is no Jesus because he is buried in the tomb. Problem is, we've never been able to find that tomb to discover whether he's there or not. And as far as I'm concerned, and as far as the Scriptures is concerned, the Bible says that the tomb is empty because he rose from the dead. But if he didn't rise from the dead, then he is still in the tomb. The second thing that Paul tells us and reminds us of in this, if, that, if there is no bodily resurrection, then all of our preaching is empty. We are preaching for no reason. We are wasting our time preaching to people, talking to them about a message that at the end of the day says Jesus died for you. He was buried in the tomb, but he's still there. And our preaching is in vain. It is empty. It is worthless. It carries nothing. It does nothing. It won't Im Im impact anybody. You might as well just keep doing what you're doing if Jesus is still in the tomb. And so our preaching is dead. We know that the apostles, as uh, Charles Colson uh, so eloquently put it, they, they preached for 40 years and not one of them changed their mind, even through all of the trouble that they went through, all for a lie if Jesus Christ did not resurrect from the dead. And so Jesus would be in the grave, preaching would be in vain, but notice what else Paul says to these Corinthians. He says that if Jesus is still in the tomb, then your faith is empty. That is to say that there is nothing, nothing of any value, nothing of any good, nothing of any substance to the faith that you proclaim as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. If the resurrection did not happen, then you are, basically, you are basically believing something that has no substance, no value, no, no worth. And so Paul says your faith is empty, but the fourth thing that Paul says is that believers are false witnesses. That would imply, or Paul says, one of the implications of Jesus still being in the tomb would be that every time you talk to somebody and tell your story, as I have been encouraging many of us to do, is to tell your story. Every time you tell your story and include the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ or that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior because all of the things that he did for you, including the resurrection, are true, if you tell your story but there is no resurrection, then basically what you have done is that you've now testified falsely concerning God and Jesus Christ. You become a false witness. You remain a false witness if you continue to preach that Jesus did not resurrect from the dead. Not only is Jesus still in the grave, not only is our preaching in vain, not only is our faith empty, not only are we false witnesses of God, but the, but the fifth thing that Paul says in this text is that faith is futile. That is, that your faith that you claim that you have is of no use to you. You can believe all you want to that Jesus came. You can believe all you want to that Jesus died on the cross. You can believe that he was tortured. You can believe all of these things. But if he didn't resurrect from the dead, then you're just basically believing in the other guy. And then, here's the worst thing. Paul says to these Corinthians, he says, if you've chosen to go down the right of not believing in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ or that there is no resurrection of anyone, then your sins remain. If Jesus Christ did not resurrect from the dead, then he went in the tomb just like everybody else and just like the other two thieves that died on the cross, he died for nothing. And your sins remain. That means that you... There is no payment for sin. There is no forgiveness of sin. There is nothing that has been done with your sin. Your sin still remains. If the Lord Jesus Christ didn't resurrect. And then Paul says, the seventh thing is, those who died believing perished. If, if, if there are Christians who all of their life preach that Jesus rose from the dead and lived their life that way, and then they died, they remain in their tomb, they're in their tomb, they'll never come out of there, and not only that, but Paul says if Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't resurrect, then those who died believing in Jesus perished. There's no heaven, there's no hope, there's no anything. They're just simply lost. 
I don't know about you, but by the time I get to the seventh one, I'm, 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 almost, I'm almost just kind of depressed. And so rightfully, if, if Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, and I'm not suggesting to you for a second that he didn't, I'm just saying, Paul, I'm just using Paul's argument. If, it's, if that is true, then the worst, even worse than, than maybe dying believing that, because at least if you died believing that, you're dead now, so it doesn't really matter. But here's the problem for the rest of us who are still alive and still preaching it and still believing it and still teaching it and still showing it and still coming to church and doing all of the things that if all of that is true, Paul says that if that is true, then verse 19 says, if, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And the eighth thing that I want to share with you is this, that of all mankind, Christians are the most pitiable. We're the saddest people on earth. We're the saddest people on earth, worse than any other person. If we staked all of our life on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and it did not happen, then we have basically wasted our time. We have wasted our lives. We have wasted resources. We have wasted all of these things. And I want to tell you something this morning, church. That is exactly the message that the world is pushing as hard as they can, that there is no resurrection. All of this about Jesus Christ didn't happen. It doesn't matter. And in its place, oh, by the way, in its place, they're, they're implementing something else. When it comes to Christians being the most pitiable, John MacArthur wrote this. He said, speaking of the resurrection, he said, if he cannot grant us eternal life, how can he improve our earthly life? Think about that for a second. If Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, then he can't grant you eternal life. And if he can't grant you eternal life, then how in the world can he improve this life now? Ah, but then there's verse 20. And Paul comes back and he says, but, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Church, I want to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ is fully, completely, totally alive. And when he came out of the tomb, he came out of the tomb with a brand new body, with all of the scars and all of the beatings and all of the suffering still very visible, but alive. And he hung around the disciples for a while, and he hung around the church and the believers for a while, and in fact, he gave them a little taste of what the rapture is going to be all about when the Bible says that many saints walked around the city of Jerusalem after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then... At the right time, Jesus gathered his disciples to that mountain and he gave them instructions and he said, go and preach the gospel. And the Bible says that he ascended into heaven and he disappeared into the clouds. And the angel said to the disciples, men, what are you looking at? The same Jesus that you saw leave is the same Jesus that is coming back. Amen? That's what we preach. Not only is Jesus alive, but he has risen. So some of us watching online or here in person today, you've invested all your life, all of your life, since the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You've invested all of your life banking on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you this morning that it has not been in vain. You have lived your life for Jesus Christ 
You have preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have shared your testimony and you have witnessed about the great things that God has done for you. I am here to tell you this morning, as the Apostle Paul, all that you have done is not in vain. But there are some of us here this morning, you spent your entire life living like nothing happened on that third day, as the scriptures say. You have lived your life for yourself. I want to tell you this morning, the gospel message is very simple. Jesus died for you, he was buried, and he rose again. And you can take whatever life you have now, turn it around, give it to the Lord Jesus Christ, all of it, every inch of it, every ounce of it, every energy that you now have, surrender it and give it to him all your all. And he can take your life and he can change it and he can make every single day from this day forward on way better than you've ever experienced in your entire lifetime without Jesus Christ if you're willing to surrender to him right now. But the most powerful thing so far that has been said was the story of that young man who just talked about what God did in his life. That can be you who are watching or here in person. Some of us claim to be Christians, say that we are Christians, but we're living a life of dualism. You're living a, 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 a life of dualism. You're, you're, like, you're like the guy by the name of Benny on, in, in the movie, The Mummy, when danger approached and he was about to be overpowered by that mummy, he pulled out just about every religious symbol out of his shirt and began to utter all of those different prayers. Do you remember that? He began to utter all of those different prayers, hoping that he would survive the attack of the mummy. Some of us are living like Benny. You know, you, you get in danger, you struggle, you get into situations and you pull out the Quran and you pull out the Bible and you pull out the Jewish Torah or whatever, you pull out all of these religious symbols and then you get kind of Hindu and then you get become a little bit of Buddha and all of this kind of stuff, hoping that some of that all mixed together and run one nice, good, hot, beefy stew will help you get out of your problem. And I'm here to tell you this morning, it didn't work for Benny and it won't work for you. Jesus said, and I want you to hear me very close because this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The question for you, if you are living a life of dualism, you're here now and over here tomorrow, if that's the life that you're living, I'm here to tell you that the question for you is the question that was asked of, Col of Caleb Holt in the movie Fireproof. Are you in? Are you all in? And that's the choice today that you and I have to make. If you are a Christian and you're waffling between two things, the question that you need to answer this morning and the question that the world desperately needs to see from the church is either that the church is all in in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ or you're all out. Either you are in. And we are starting to see in our country now pastors and preachers who are coming out and they are saying, I no longer believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I no longer believe in the Bible. I no longer think that the things of the Bible are true. They have made a decision. They have made a choice, and it is their freedom to do so, but they have made that decision. And some of us have made the decision that we believe that from Genesis to Revelation, all of it is the Word of God. It is inerrant. It is powerful. It is our final authority. And there we sit and there we stand and we will not be moved. But church, it can't be just your pastor. It can't just be your preachers. It can't just be your evangelist. You and I, wherever we are and wherever we go, we must make the decision, either you are in or you are out. Either you are all in or all out. 
We are getting ready to launch two services to reach to the community and reach that people are lost. We either need to be all in or we're all out. But you can't be in the middle. That won't work. And so this morning, if you are here and you identify with any of these persons that I have just described, if you are all in, have been from the day you came to know Jesus Christ, I congratulate you. My challenge to you this morning is take a stand and remain standing. And don't quit. Jesus resurrected and he's alive. If you are here this morning and you've lived your life in every imaginable way except living it for Jesus Christ, and today you say, Pastor, I need to be all in, then I'm asking you this morning to make a decision, to say a prayer, to invite Jesus Christ into your heart and commit to him today totally and completely for the rest of your life. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I ask you to do that today. God asks you to do that today. And if you are a Christian and you're playing the dualism game, today you need to make a decision. You're going to be all in or you're going to be all out. I'm going to ask you to bow your head right there where you are. And those of you watching online, in just a few moments, we're going to put up a number there. And you can text LIFE um, to the number that is there. And you can tell us about the decision that you have made. So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's the day you say, Pastor, what do I do? Let me lead you in a prayer. You say it to God with all of your heart. Mean it to Him when you say, say this prayer. Father, I realize today and I accept that I am a sinner and I am lost. I repent of my sin today. I reject all that offends you. And I ask for your forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me all of all of my sin. I choose today to believe that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said that he was, that he is. He died for my sin. He was buried in the tomb and he rose on the third day. I believe that today with all of my heart. And I surrender my life to him right now, today. And I surrender to him as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed to Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here and you've been living a life of dualism. You've been wavering and wandering between two things. Today, this morning, God says to you, decide, make a decision. Just like Joshua told the people of Israel, you choose today whom you are going to serve. Either you are all in or you are all out. Make that decision. Why don't you pray to the Lord right now and say, Father, here I am. I know I've been playing a dual game. I know that's wrong. I know that that lifestyle doesn't match what I believe in my heart. I gave my life to, to Jesus Christ a long time ago. And I know that I need to repent of anything that has offended you. And I'm willing to do that right now. And I ask you to forgive me. And this day, today, right now, I make the decision to return back to you and to begin to living my life all in for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then church, those of you who have been faithful all of your life from the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ, would you just ask God to now, right now, right there where you are, would you ask him to give you the boldness to take a stand, to continue to stand, Church, I'm telling you right now, it is going to be more difficult as the days go by, but he can empower you. I'm here to tell you, church, the more the church gathered to pray, the more powerful they became. Church, we need to come together and gather and pray and ask God to do some mighty things and to embolden his servants wherever they are, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I come to you now, and I'll take just a moment to say thank you for your word and thank you for this, this message. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me 
of the necessity of taking a stand and remaining true to your word and remaining true to the gospel and being a faithful servant all the days of my life until you call me home. Father, I intend to do that. I pray this morning that not only I, but every pastor that believes in the word of God will take a stand right there where he is, whether he's got a large church or a small church. I pray for the church now, Lord, these, those who have been faithful all of their life from the day they came to know Jesus Christ. I pray, Heavenly Father, today that your Holy Spirit would empower them to be witnesses, to stand, and to share the gospel with anyone who comes their way. If you prayed any of those prayers, maybe this morning what you need to do is you need to walk to this altar and say, God, here I am. Here I am. I, I, I want to make my decision public. Maybe you invited Jesus Christ into your heart for the first time today, and you want to make that public. You want to say, hey, I'm not ashamed anymore. I'm going to make that decision. Online, if you'll just text life to that number right there and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer. I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to know what I have to do next from this day forward. If you will do that online, we will help you. We will send you a message. We will talk to you about what you can do. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. We're going to hang out here. We're going to be here for a while longer. If you need to talk, if you're, you need to talk to anybody uh, about the decision and prayer that you made, we'll be glad to do that for you. Church, I thank you so much. I know that we are getting ready to start two services. So let me just quickly say, church, we're getting ready to send out 5,000 mail outs all over this city. Okay? Now, listen, that card is not a magic card. It's not a magic card. Okay? But it is a message. It is a message. But now here's what we need to do. We need to come together. We need to pray. And we'll put that out there. But, but if you will, at least make your way on Wednesday nights. We're going to begin to pray. And we're going to pray that as those 5,000 cards go out into the community, that somebody who desperately needs that card will see the message, keep the message, and then come on that day, whether they come at 9 o'clock or they come at 11, 11, it doesn't matter. But church, we can't expect to send 5,000 cards out to 5,000 people and just expect that that card somehow magically is going to bring all those people. I'm telling you, that's not how it works. We need to pray and trust God. Do our work. So we're going to do our work, 5,000 mail outs, right? But then we're going to come and do the better work, which is come together and pray and ask God to do a supernatural thing. Amen? So let me challenge you to do that. Keep an eye on Facebook and, and all of those things where we put out those announcements. But I invite you to come on Wednesdays. We're going to start praying for that to happen uh, starting this Wednesday. So God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Gershon. We're going to sing our closing song. Let's all stand and sing our uh, closing song.
flashes of lightning, pearls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. Have a wonderful week. Be blessed.